Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Chris. Um, this is my third lecture now for Remy University. Um, I'm going to be looking at something that a lot of people um, find quite difficult to understand, quite difficult to grasp the different concepts. Um, it's the British people, uh, more specifically the English people. Um, we're going to have a look at the development of some of the idiosyncrasies of the English. Um, why we're not the same as Americans, why we're not the same as the French, why we're not the same as the Germans, and give you some kind of historical background as to how the English character developed and hopefully give you a lot of insight into um, the actual modern English person. So the first thing we need to look at is the idea of British or English. Um, the values that have been basically promoted in media, maybe for the last 200 years, have largely been English values. The British um, is largely an, an imaginary invention that was created basically just for passport convenience because we have um, the Welsh and the Scottish and the Irish, uh, the Northern Irish, sorry, together in one United Kingdom. The idea of the British. Um, is basically just to make paperwork easier. The Scottish and the Welsh have their own distinct national identities. The Irish and the people in Northern Ireland have their specific um, national identities. We're just going to focus on the theme of Englishness in this particular um, lecture, mostly because it's very interesting. It is very, very funny if you can appreciate the humour in some of the situations. and. Um, I hope it'll be interesting. I hope it'll give you some insight into how to actually deal with the English and the fact that the English are not being unfriendly, they're just being, well, they're just being English. Some of the key questions or some of the questions that a lot of people will find themselves asking when they, um, when they visit England or when they visit uh, England, uh, or the, when they meet people from England, why do the English seem so obsessed with games? Why do so many English people enjoy complaining and seem to enjoy being persecuted? How did the English acquire the odd attitudes towards relationships and towards food? And why are the English such huge hypocrites? Why do they say one thing and do another? The idea of the modern Englishman was born pretty much with this guy. This guy is uh, Cecil Rhodes, and he was the poster boy for the British Empire in the Victorian times. You can see here on this cartoon that was drawn at the time of the height of his fame and the height of his success that he basically stands over Africa, North Africa and South Africa. He controls it. He is the central pillar of the British Empire in Africa. And he wrote at the time, ask any man what nationality he would prefer to be, and 99 times out of 100, they will tell you that they would prefer to be an Englishman. This guy loved England. He did not see any other nationality being as good as being English. He actually wrote later on that to be English was to have won first prize in the lottery of life. He thought being English was the thing to be. England was the country to be. All the other countries were below. They were, they were subservient to the English. The English had the cultural superiority over these uh, over these other cultures, and they showed that by the way that they um, obviously the, the bl long and bloody history of the British Empire in Africa and India. So, to begin with, we have to explore the idea of the stiff upper lip. The stiff upper lip is uh, it's essentially an American idea that was created to describe the British lack of emotionality of any kind to have emotions. To be English and to show emotions in public was a big, big problem. You had to be unemotional, you had to be calm, you had to be reliable, and you had to be totally dependable. You had to be the kind of person um, someone would be happy to have in a shipwreck because the English would never get flustered or panicked about any kind of problem that would ever happen. 
This idea of the step of the lip was a relatively new invention and before that you may be very surprised to hear that before the Victorian era the English were actually very very emotional. Italian writers would come to London, hang out in the coffee shops, write books, and they would be surprised at how emotional the English people were. They would kiss each other and greeting each other, they would kiss each other during the dinner, they would kiss each other when they were leaving. There was a lot of physical contact, there was a lot of love being shown, but now it's a big taboo. In order to look at this idea, we need to go back to the Battle of Waterloo. Specifically, we need to go back to June 18th, 1815. And this painting that was, um, that was painted uh, around the same time, just after actually, um, shows uh, Lord Uxbridge, he's at the front, and behind him is one of his guards. Uh, what's happened here is that Lord Uxbridge, uh, lying on the ground, has been wounded quite mortally. Uh, well, well, they thought he was a mortal wound anyway, and he's actually lost his leg. He was actually um, hit with a cannon shot uh, below the knee during the battle. Here he is, another painting of Lord Uxbridge. When his friend, the Duke of Wellington, rode up and saw Lord Uxbridge lying on the floor, Lord Uxbridge looked up at him and said, I've lost my leg, by God. Duke, well Duke of Wellington looked down and said, by God, and you have. And that was about it. This was about the most emotion that either of them ever showed about this guy, Lord Uxbridge, having his leg blown off by a cannonball. The story gets even, even kind of more bizarre when, you, when you're kind of thinking about the development of the English character in this incredible situation. Uh, Lord Uxbridge's leg was amputated. It was cut off below the knee in surgery. Now there was never any emotion, there was never be any big uh, emotional uh, meeting with the doctor, there was no begging to have something done with the leg. The doctor wrote in his diary later that he simply reassured Lord Uxbridge that the leg was better off than on and that was it. He, he just kind of reassured him and just said it's better off than on. Lord Uxbridge completely uh, accepted this idea. He had a stiff upper lip. He didn't blub, he didn't cry, he just accepted it and said, thought that the doctor knew what he was doing. When he returned to England, he was offered a war pension of uh, 1,200, uh, 1200 pounds a year, which was a huge, huge amount in 1815. It was a couple, you know, two or three, uh, it, was, it, was a, it was about a quarter of a million pounds, I think, now in adjusted, adjusted money. Um, to compensate him for the loss of the leg, he could never walk again, um, he, was, he was offered this money, but he was refused. He, he refused the money. He said, to lose the leg beating the French in the service of my country was good enough. And the leg was put on display in the Waterloo War Museum in Belgium. It actually became a celebrity. This guy's leg became a celebrity. And the legend that grew up around it, and the legend that grew up around uh, Wellington and Uxbridge on uh, the battlefield, um, became a, a British legend, an English legend. Sh this should be what English people should be like. In the face of terrible adversity, adversity you should uh, just show no emotion. Moving on, we have to move on to the Second World War because this was really when the English character was um, solidified. It was crystallized and it was, um, it was also reflected in a lot of the media at the time. Um, at the height of the war, um, the, the Nazi forces had occupied France, uh, taken over most of Europe, and they were stuck at the channel. The channel was really the only thing that was saving us. We're going to see later on that the channel, uh, the body of water between England and France that separates England and France, has really been something that has both isolated and insulated um, the United Kingdom against some of the ideas and some of the dangerous forces that have risen up in Europe, the Nazis uh, being one of them. This is a very, very famous picture here. You may have seen this picture um, around, especially on the internet somewhere, maybe in a war museum about uh, the Second World War. This picture shows a milkman. London has been bombed, 
Uh, buildings have been destroyed, There's uh, no one has their homes anymore. The milkman still delivers the milk in the morning. So World War II really was um, the defining time for the English. It was a very, very useful propaganda tool for uh, the, the British government to um, push towards, push into the consciousness of everybody who lived in the United Kingdom. They had a very clear, positive sense of themselves, and more importantly, they saw, the, they saw that image reflected back at them in the movies that they saw in the cinema. And you have to remember that this is in an age before television. Radio is the main mass media tool. But to actually see the news, people would actually go into the cinema and watch the newsreels. So after the newsreels, which would invariably carry coverage of the, uh, of the, the war going on in Belgium and in France, um, they would actually have the real-life news story, and then they would have the fantasy uh, propaganda movies, which would show these idealized stories and these idealized uh, situations of how people should act, how, people should, uh, how English people should act in this incredible um, face of adversity, adversity that we, we, we were seeing. Okay. Officers in the armed forces were divided by class, but more importantly, they were united by a common idea. They shared the same belief. Women knew their place. This kind of change towards the end of the war, because so many men were going off, and so many men were com going off to war, so many men were coming back from war horribly, horribly um, disabled. They would lose their legs, they would lose their arms. They wouldn't be able to work as manual laborers. Now, what England needed at the time uh, during the Second World War, they needed people to build bombs, they needed people to build planes, they needed people to build the basic kind of uh, mechanics of war. They need people to put them together, these tools of war. So towards the end of the, of the war, um, the women were moved into the factories. But the idea of um, self-sacrifice and doing what you are told, uh, especially if you're a, ch if you're a child, uh, the idea of self-sacrifice for the women, especially, this was especially important because the men would go off to fight in, in Belgium, but they would probably get married a couple of days before they left. Mm -hmm. Um, to, their, to their sweethearts, but then they would go off to Belgium and then they would meet some, uh, some beautiful woman. Invariably, they would have an affair because they were away for eight, nine months, and then they would come back uh, to meet their wives, who had probably met someone else as well, and then we had two people in a very unhappy marriage. So the ideas that, um, that were being put out were blatant, transparent propaganda, basically just to hold, just to try to hold the family unit together. Because it was very, very difficult to get a divorce in those times. Um, if you wanted a divorce, you, need, you either needed to prove adultery, you need to prove, you needed to have photographs and witnesses that your husband had met another woman, or you needed to be uh, diagnosed as being clinically insane. One movie that really sums up the attitude and the fears of the government and essentially told people how to behave in this situation um, was a film called Brief Encounter. And I'm going to play, I'm gonna play um, a trailer from the time. This film was made in 1945. I'm going to play that movie. Well, I'm not going to play the movie, but I'm going to play the movie trailer for you so that you can see some of the ideas that were put uh, across to the British people in cinema. Okay, so. Can I help you? Uh, oh, no, please, don't tell me who am I. Can I pulling your eyelid down as far as it'll go? And then blowing your nose. 
Please let me look. I happen to be a doctor. That's very kind of you. Oh, turn on the light, please. That's how it all began. Just through me again, we'll have a little piece of grit in my eye. Oh, Mr. Bryce, are you going to picture this afternoon? Yes. How extraordinary, so am I. I thought you had to be all day at the hospital. Well, between ourselves, I killed two patients by accident this morning, and the matron is very displeased with me. I simply don't go back. What's she like, your wife? Madeline? Small, dark, rather delicate. Quite funny, I suppose we'll look fair. Your husband, what's he like? Medium height, brown hair, kindly, unemotional, and not delicate at all. Each other, there's too much in the way. There's two times. We control ourselves. And behave like sensible human beings. There's two times. I'm an ordinary woman. I didn't think such violent things could happen to ordinary people. Okay, so this was pretty racy stuff for the war. It addressed typical problems, it addressed real problems that people were facing. Uh, we'll go back to this picture now. Um, this is a very famous picture. It embodies the English spirit of uh, make, do and mend. Everything's been bombed. Milkman is still delivering the milk in the morning. The only problem is that this photo is actually completely fake. The man in the photograph is the photographer's assistant. Um, he just basically went how he saw the milk, uh, the photographer saw the milk on somebody's doorstep and got his assistant to put on a milkman's coat, a white coat here, uh, put the milk in his pocket and then they staged the photograph and took, took the photograph and it became a national symbol. It, 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 you've heard of going viral when something goes viral on social networks. This photograph did the same thing. It's still available to print it on, for, on postcards uh, even now at the British War Museum. It's still promoted as the ideal idea of an Englishman under pressure. Moving into post-war Britain, um, a survey in People magazine, they had um, a, a survey that was done in this very famous magazine. Um, there were around 11,000 responses. And basically this survey, this questionnaire showed that um, English national character hadn't changed in over 150 years. So this was done in the early 50s. So going back, this was like 1950, 1850, in the start of the 19th century, people still believed that they had this character that went all the way back to essentially the time of the, you know, a, 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 near the time where we were still fighting the French. It's, it's only, um, the, the battle was in 1815, the Battle of Waterloo, and it was only about 40, so 95 years after that, we still had, we crystallized this idea of the Englishman, and people in 1950 believed that they still had this, uh, this kind of uh, national identity. 
One of the researchers said, when I was reading with extreme care the first batch of questionnaires which I received, I found out I was constantly making the same notes. What dull lives most of these people appear to lead. And secondly, what good people. And in 1965, when he was interviewed, he said to himself, um, I should still make the same judgments. So it, going on, the, the wars that people had endured and the hardships that people had endured um, really brought people together and really solidified this kind of mythical idea of the English. And it was basically promoted through films like Brief Encounter. An example of what happened after the war in Britain was that um, there is a royal generation gap now. It's not the generation gap that you might think of. Um, the Queen has been married to Prince Philip for, let's say, about uh, 68 years. They were married in 1947. Her four children, four children have had three divorces between them. So there's only been one happy marriage in, in all of the Queen's children, the, the ultimate symbol of Great Britain, the ultimate symbol, the, the brand that we export all over the world. Her, her own children haven't been able to maintain a stable marriage. This is because the wartime values that were promoted, the wartime values of being sensible, like you saw in the video, Celia Johnson said that we must be sensible people even though we don't love our spouses anymore and we found new love between us, we must be sensible and stay married even though we're unhappy. There was a bigger sin, there was a greater sense of self-sacrifice, there was a greater sense that people were doing something for the good of the people and the good of the country. And when they were facing the extinction of pretty much their own culture in a, a, a situation like the Second World War, um, it's, it's much easier to think that you are doing something that for the good of the world. Now people's responsibilities have become much more uh, self-focused, they've become much more focused on their own career, and they've become much more focused on their own needs. People get divorced at a shocking rate in England these days. I think the, the rates now are something like 200,000 divorces a year, and this is in a country that has a population of 65 million people. It has deeper ramifications for the economy if people, aren't, if, uh, people basically aren't making babies and having children. This is a big problem for the economy. And it also means that more, pe more single mothers become reliant on the social state. So lots of people have been questioning, is the, has there been a loss of identity after the Second World War? The English do not have a national song. Um, the Scottish have a national song. The Welsh have uh, Land of My Fathers. They sing that. The English don't have anything. I think the closest that we've got is a song called Jerusalem, which is a religious song anyway, so a lot of religious people don't know the words. Um, there's no national dress. You might see people dressed up as Morris men, I guess, but um, the Scottish have the kilts. Um, we don't know. Uh, the English... Uh, I'm counting myself as an English person. The English person, the English people don't have any kind of national dress. And what's probably more shocking to the Chinese, uh, any Chinese viewers, um, no one ever celebrates England's National Day. Actually, I only found out that England's National Day is on April 23rd. So get together uh, with your friends, uh, with your English friends, and uh, celebrate English, uh, England's National Day. Because Nobody else does. The Irish wear green on St. Patrick's Day. Americans swear allegiance to the flag. The English don't really do anything. We, we complain about the trains. We don't really do anything that reinforces any sense of national identity anymore. And this has caused some uh, concern among the British MPs. For example, I'll show you this. Uh, this is what one Conservative MP wrote. Look at the French. Their problems are as great as ours, but they know who they are. They, even if they don't know where they're going, they know who they are. Not only do we not know where we're going, we don't even know who we are any longer. We haven't got a clue. And it's very true. We have the, the Scottish and the, French and the Welsh and the uh, people in, in Ireland, they have a very strong sense. We have these, and the French, on either side, we have these countries that have very, very strong senses of national identity 
We don't. The English just don't have it. The reason for this, basically, is because we've never been occupied by a foreign power. The last French king that we had was in 1066. We would get a lot of French words from it, but in, since then we've had nothing, we've had no reason to actually um, define ourselves. There's been no attempts to destroy indigenous culture in the UK. No one's actually done it. Even when the English invaded Scotland, we didn't actually attempt to destroy the culture. Um, the English just cleared out lands and gave and, and um, moved them into uh, and into kind of shoddy replacement housing. There was no attempt to actually dominate the culture. The English at the time just wanted the land. So the English never attempt to define themselves. We actually find it quite distasteful when people do try to English people do try to um, uh, define themselves simply because we've had no need to. I'll give you an example here. This is Eurostar, and what happened with Eurostar was that the French embarked on a massive upgrade of its rail network, to, uh, and they got the trains up to about 186 kilometers an hour. What happened on the English side was that we finally got our um, trains up to 186 kilometers an hour, but we did it in 2007. The French had managed to do it in, in 1994. So up from 1994 to 2007, fast French trains would have to essentially halve their speed when they joined the English rail network. The French government imposed their will. It got built. In England, the British government had endless meetings, endless rounds of debates, endless kind of compromises were trying to be made, and it delayed it by nearly 13 years. This is what the problem is. There is no national pride in actually building anything that will compete with even the French anymore. So uh, the individualism that is encouraged in the English makes, pe makes English people quite difficult to lead. Um, if you, there's an old saying, an old joke, if you want to lead an Englishman, find out where he's going and walk in front of him. And it's this lack of organization that is causing massive, massive infrastructure problems. And whenever someone does try to show leadership, people always resent that leadership. One example um, that I'm going to give you now, the reason why this happens and the way that, and the way that um, these kind of people get generated in schools, especially the public school system where people had to sit and exam and pay for, uh, pay, for the, um, pay for the subscriptions every year, pay for the term fees. Eton College, Reverend Dr. John Keats was appointed the headmaster in 1809. He was very, very famous for beating his students and boasted that he beat around 10 students a day in the school. These were junior high school students. Uh, these were um, high school students, maybe 11 to 16 years old. So his idea of creating discipline and creating leadership and people who would recognize leadership was basically to beat respect into his students. At the end of one day on June 30th, 1832, he boasted that he'd beaten about 80 boys. And so this was about 10, 10 an hour. Um, the other students cheered when they heard this, and when he retired, they actually paid for a huge expensive memorial. So the actual plan here backfired. Um, he was trying to beat respect into these boys. It actually became that these boys grew up into men who were very, very good at hiding their emotions. When three French scientists were awarded the Nobel Peace Prize a few years ago, a national holiday was declared. Chil school children had the day off. When Aaron Klug, um, an, an English chemist, uh, won the Nobel Prize for Chemistry, he just uh, thought it, sat back, smiled to himself, and said, I can afford a new bicycle now. There was deep repression of emotions that came from the attempts to instill leadership in the boys. So these ideas that have come over, um, we, we don't come over from France or come over from Germany. They've tried to come over. We tried to have this idea of an English citizen. 
French citizens and German citizens have very, very strong ideas of themselves. The, the problem is, is the English don't really make any attempt to even accept these ideas. They don't kill these ideas. They just let them die of neglect. No one gets together. No one gets together and, and, and gets motivated. France and Germany have gone through monarchies. They've become republics. They've had two French empires. But the English system has pretty much stayed the same for 200 years nothing much the biggest upheaval that happened was the wealth the establishment of the welfare state the national health system uh, where people get free health care that was it that's the biggest thing that's happened communication problems are a big issue alexander william kinglake in 1835 he traveled across the syrian desert he met another englishman traveling the other way he wrote in his diary later, as we approached each other, it became with me a question of whether we should speak. He'd been in the desert alone for about eight or nine days. Now he sees another Englishman and um, he's asking himself, do I talk to this guy? Then he realizes later, um, I could not think of anything particular that I had to say to him. So why is this a, commu this is a communication problem that people have? Um, if you're on the train, there's another old joke from the 1950s, uh, someone will say, excuse me sir, you've dropped some cigar ash on your trousers. The Englishman will reply, for the past 10 minutes I've been watching a box of matches on fire in your back pocket, but I didn't interfere with you for that. The idea of the, um, the English are indifferent, but this does not mean that we don't like you. Okay. Um, the only way really to be accepted in English society is to act, act indifferent as well. Um, a great example is the uh, um, uh, American, Americans will always go over and visit England and they will be more interactive, they will be more sociable with the people that they meet there and the English will not respond. The English will be totally indifferent. Now, this is because we have a very deep idea, a deep sense of privacy. It can sometimes be confused with misanthropy, with kind of a hatred of other people. It's not. It's just the idea that um, everybody's private. The invasion of privacy is a sacred idea to the English. If you're a foreign visitor, the only time that you'll probably be invited into someone's home, an Englishman's home, is when you're leaving the country. There'll be no kind of acceptance of you being a worker and then going out and socializing with your workmates. We just don't do it. So the English value privacy above, above everything else. Talking to people, calling someone up, sending an email, invariably means that we violate that idea of privacy. And this can be shown in the homeowner statistics. The English are often twice as likely to own a house as German people. The reason being, we need our privacy. The English need their privacy. And the English spend a lot of time enhancing their houses. They do it themselves, DIY. They try to upgrade their houses. They try and make, the, put, make their houses unique. And we spend nearly £8,000 a year on improving our own, home, our, our own homes. We don't use numbers, very rarely use numbers. We like to give our houses names, like pets. Here are some of them, the Acorns, Angel Cottage, the woodlands, there's no numbers here. It's too common, it's too indifferent. It's, the home is special, we need to give it a name. The problem is, uh, one of the dark sides of this uh, obsession with privacy means that sometimes in houses, horrific crimes can take place and they often go unreported by the neighbors. Um, often when the, the journalists will interview the neighbors of some, around some ho house of horrors where people have been murdered and the most common answer that is given is, I didn't like to pry. Um, this is one of the downsides with uh, with uh, the obsession with privacy. I can't really go uh, in any kind of um, lecture about the English character without talking about the weather. Um, the weather is a source of much uh, discussion in England. People love talking about it. Um, foreigners that come to England, German people don't talk about the weather, French don't talk about the weather, um, Chinese people don't talk about the weather half as much as the English do. 
The problem is, as this graphic clearly illustrates, is that the, uh, the weather is quite boring. One writer actually mentioned, he actually made a point of writing in the national newspaper in England that um, he loves the weather. He loves wearing the same type of clothes all year round, all year round. The weather suits him fine, but he still doesn't understand why English people talk about it so much. So British weather isn't interesting or exciting. There are no monsoons, there are no tornadoes, there are no huge hailstorms like you get in America where windows are broken. There are no hurricanes. So why do we talk about it so much? The thing about the British weather is that it's uncertain. It's not exciting, but there is a lot of it. You can never be quite sure what you're going to get. There's been many, many different ways and, and kind of folk methods of trying to predict the weather. No one's actually got it right yet. Even people who work for the BBC and do the weather forecast can never actually get it absolutely right. And we enjoy that. We enjoy that fact that people can't get it right, that it's unpredictable. You can go to bed, it'll be a sunny day, it'll be a clear skies. You can wake up, it'll be a horrendous thunderstorm. And then after the horrendous thunderstorm in the morning, in the afternoon, bright skies, in the evening, it'll be foggy. You never really know what you're going to get, and that's the reason why people love the weather. People love the weather so much that they will listen to weather reports not for their area. Um, a good example of this is the shipping forecast. The shipping forecast on Radio 4 is a report of the weather conditions at sea. I'll give you an example here. Humber, Thames, southeast, veering southwest 4 or 5, occasionally 6 later, thundery showers, moderate or good, occasionally poor. Tyne, Dogger, northeast 3 or 4, occasional rain, moderate or poor. These are typical reports that you'll get on the shipping forecast. It's only useful for people who are at sea. The problem is that people love finding out about the weather. So this is one of the highest rated programs on the radio. It's usually broadcast at 12.48 and the BBC wanted to change the time of the broadcast. They wanted to make it 12 minutes later and broadcast it at 1 o'clock. There was national outrage over this. People did not like this. Editorials were written in newspapers. They discussed it with the Prime Minister in Parliament. That the time change of this traditional program was going to affect the, the whole psyche of the English people and cause absolute chaos. This is the power of uh, the uncertainty of the weather in England. So why do people stay in England? Why do people come to England and stay for years? Well, this quote here, I can go away, spend six months in the jungle, come back and walk into a room, and people won't ask a single question about where I've been or what I've been doing. They'll just say, lovely to see you, sit down, have a drink. People, there's a certain group of people that do seem to really love the indifference of the English. There's um, a feeling that we don't want to ask what brought you here. You're, a, you don't, actually, you're not from here, you're a foreigner. But we don't really want to know the story of how you came here. We're pleased that you're here and we'd like to have a cup of tea with you, but we don't really want to pry into your private reasons for leaving your own country. So some people find this incredibly, incredibly comforting. And um, I, I think it's one of the, the, um, the great strengths of the English people that we don't seem to be accepting, but we really don't ask too many questions about why you're here. But we are secretly pleased that you are. If you'd like to know more about the English, I, it's such a big topic, I can only give you a brief taster and some of the more eccentric characters in in English history and English culture. The English, a portrait of a people by Jeremy Paxman. Jeremy Paxman is a very famous TV journalist. He's wrote, written a very good book. Um, the Stiff Upper Lip with Ian Hislop. This was on a BBC TV series. It shows you the emotional history 
of the English people. Hopefully you'll get a little bit more of insight in, uh, from watching that. And as well, um, another Jeremy Paxman book, he's been quite a prolific writer, Empire by BBC Books. You'll be able to find this on Amazon. This will give you a very detailed and objective um, view of the British Empire, the second British Empire that really did define the English character. And uh, there is a last one here, uh, Watching the English, which is a sociological, sociological report. It's only available in, um, it's not actually been published outside uh, on general, um, uh, to, you know, you, you can't actually buy it from, uh, from Amazon or anything like that, but it, it's excerpts from it are out there. It's, it's quite a thick sociological report, so be prepared for some difficult English with that. Uh, thank you very much for watching. Uh, my name is uh, Chris Crook. If you'd like to uh, ask some more questions, if you'd like to discuss any of these points with me, please do send me an email, mtcp56 at gmail.com. Bye-bye.